This guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, he was a type in a picture, a living portrait and picture of the Antichrist. Let's look at it. So this guy right here, here's a, this is an actual sculpture of him. It's probably what he looked like. He's missing his nose here, though. Maybe somebody was angry and, and broke that off. I don't know. He was a real super evil and horrible guy. So I call him Antichrist Epiphanes, not Antiochus, but Antichrist Epiphanes, because he was such a picture of that son of perdition, that evil, evil guy. So let's look further into it. So here we are. Um, he had a bride, okay? This is a coin with her image on it. He had a bride, and her name was Laodice the Fourth. Now, why is that important? Or Laodice, excuse me, I mispronounced that. But why is it important that it's Laodice the Fourth? Why would that be significant that his bride, okay? Remember, Jesus has the bride of Christ, who is the church right now. Well, the Antichrist also has a bride. And the Antichrist type had a bride. And let's look at it right now. Okay. Laodicea. Laodicea was named after Laodice. Isn't that amazing? The church of Laodicea, we know, was the apostate church, the church that Jesus wasn't even in, that he spit out of his mouth, the Bible says. And we see the bride of this Antichrist type was named Laodis, or Laodicea was named after Laodis. Wow. Was Antiochus Epiphanes the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 11 and 12? Or is there a future Antiochus Epiphanes, a worse than him, the Antichrist? Well, you're going to find out in this episode because... <laughs> We're going to go dive deep into this character, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, who was a very vile person and did fulfill Daniel chapter 11. But there's a future guy coming that Jesus talked about. Jesus talked about this, this evil guy. And so did Paul in, in 2 Thessalonians. We see Paul talking about this son of perdition, this Antichrist who is to come and will set himself up in, this, uh, in the temple, in the holy place. Paul talked about it. Jesus talked about it. Jesus called Daniel a prophet. Some people say like the book of Daniel couldn't even been written by Daniel because it was too specific on world history of that time. Well, Jesus called him a prophet. <laughs> so the argument should be over right there, uh, right? Wouldn't you think so? So I think it would. But hey, we're going to look into it in this episode. We're going to look at Antiochus Epiphanes the Fourth, and I promise you, you will be blessed by this. So Let's, without further ado, let's get into the presentation right now. Okay, so Antiochus Biphanes, I believe he is a type. He was a type of the Antichrist. Just like Joseph or Yosef, if you're in Israel, he was a type in a picture of Yeshua Mashiach or Jesus Christ because Joseph had, he was the father's most favored son. He was rejected and hated by his own brothers who were the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember, he told them the dreams where they would all bow down to him and they hated him even more for that, poor Joseph. And a lot of people have taught that Joseph was a spoiled brat. No, nowhere in the Bible does it even hint to that. These were dreams from God and he shared them because they were prophetic dreams and they came to pass. And they did bow their faces down to the earth. Just like Jesus said to Caiaphas, you will see the Son of Man at the right hand of the throne <laughs> coming in all his glory. You know, these are prophetic things. And they hated Jesus even the more. Why? Because they were jealous. They were jealous of Joseph too. Well, later they conspired to murder Joseph when they saw him coming near. They stripped him of his tunic sold him for pieces of silver, and then handed him over to the Gentiles. Then later, he was falsely accused. And then he was put down in that place of the condemned. It was there that two were with him. One was forgiven, the other one, and, and, and restored to the king, and he lived. The other one was cursed to death. Remember the two on the cross with Jesus? Wow, right? And then he was raised up out of that place of the condemned, 
and he was brought before the throne, and he was the only one found worthy to reveal God's future plan. Just like Jesus in Revelation was the only one found worthy to take the scrolls out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Those scrolls speaking of the end events, how it all will come down and take place. Then he was exalted, he was glorified, all had to bow the knee to Joseph, remember that? Except for he who sat on the throne. And then he was given a Gentile bride. And he was with her for a long time. And when that last piece of grain came in, that last harvest from the Gentile land came in, then that seven-year time of trouble, or you could even say Jacob or Jacob's trouble, right, came. And that's when Israel, all of Israel, was saved. All of Israel, my friend. Just like Romans 11, verse 25, when that last number of Gentiles has come to Christ, then all of Israel will be saved. That means in one moment in time, Israel will be saved. And then he unites his old family with his new as one family, and they live in the best of the land. Who did I describe? Joseph or Jesus. So he was a type and a picture of Jesus, of Yeshua Mashiach. He was a living portrait and a picture, a painting of him. Now, this guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, he was a type and a picture, a living portrait and picture of the Antichrist. Let's look at it. So this guy right here, here's a, this is an actual sculpture of him. It's probably what he looked like. He's missing his nose here, though. Maybe somebody was angry and, and broke that off. I don't know. He was a real super evil and horrible guy. So I call him Antichrist Epiphanes, not Antiochus, but Antichrist Epiphanes, because he was such a picture of that son of perdition, that evil, evil guy. So let's look further into it. So here we are. Um, he had a bride, okay? This is a coin with her image on it. He had a bride, and her name was Laodice the Fourth. Now, why is that important? Or Laodice, excuse me, I mispronounced that. But why is it important that it's Laodice the fourth? Why would that be significant that his bride, okay? Remember, Jesus has the bride of Christ, who is the church right now. Well, the Antichrist also has a bride. And the Antichrist type had a bride. And let's look at it right now, okay? Laodicea. Laodicea was named after Laodice. Isn't that amazing? The church of Laodicea, we know, was the apostate church, the church that Jesus wasn't even in, that he spit out of his mouth, the Bible says. And we see the bride of this Antichrist type was named Laodice, or Laodicea was named after Laodice. Wow. <laughs> We're going to look at that further in this chapter. But first, let's get into this timeline. Uh, in the beginning, God. In the end, God. That's how I like to do my timelines. But here we have creation, uh, the flood. We have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or Yaakov. And we know that's right around 2000 BC, which means before Christ. And then we have uh, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Yosef, my favorite character. And then Moses or Moshe and Joshua, which is Yeshua in Hebrew, right? And that's right around 1400 BC before Christ. Then we have David or David. That's 1000 BC, 1000 before Christ. We know we have dates for that. And then we get into Isaiah or Ishiao, if you're in Israel, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, and Micah. So they were, these guys were around 500. Not Isaiah. Isaiah was like 700 BC before Christ. But Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Micah, these guys were around 500, 600 BC. And then there was this one or 400 years of silence between that and 0 AD. We know that 0 AD means um, Anno Domini. AD just means Anno Domini. Okay. So that time period from uh, Daniel's time, 500 to 600, where he wrote this about this vile person, Antiochus Epiphanes, this horrible guy, and the abomination of desolation, right, that left the holy place desolate. He prophesied about that around 500 to 600 before Christ, and this guy was alive, and he did his thing in 167 before Christ. So it was hundreds of years after Daniel prophesied it. And then there was uh, 0 AD which came later, the year of our Lord, the very first Christmas when Jesus was born. 
So that's a quick timeline. So we know where we're at in history on this. So Antiochus Epiphanes, he was an illegitimate king. He seized the throne by flattery, just like Daniel wrote down, that he would seize the throne by smooth speech, by a silver tongue, right? So this guy's a smooth talker. All right, so he called himself Theos Antiochus Theos Epiphanes. Loosely translated means, I am God, most glorious manifest. Whoa. How dare he claim that? And how dare any politician or world leader ever say it's like an epiphany, right? That is a a scary thing to say as a smooth-talking world leader. Okay, so this is an image of him. This is probably what he looked like on one of the coins that were found in archaeology. And on the back of the coin, you could see it right here, Epiphony. It's an Epiphony with his name right here as well, which means God manifest. How horrible of a thing to say. So the Jews called him, I love this, the Jewish people called him Antiochus Epimenes, which means the mad one. I love that. I love <laughs> I love the humor and also the courage it took to, to do that. And... Uh, I think it's awesome. So I love the the pun there. Isn't that cool? All right, so let's get back into the presentation. So the Jews called him that. It was great. So the South was so sick of Antiochus Epiphanes that they called on a new superpower to help them. Who was it? Rome. This is when Rome just started to come in and take over what was the remnants of the Grecian uh, Empire. And that's what we see in this in this history. So Let's continue. Here is a, the world, right? And remember, Alexander the Great conquered this known world of that time, and he conquered it fast. In fact, he was predicted or prophesied about in the book of Daniel because what happened was Alexander the Great, this great king, and he was described in Daniel, of course, as his Grecian empire. The angel interprets that for him. But he conquered the world extremely fast. He took out uh, Persia. Um, and he was this the, the, the ram that took him out super fast, right? And that was the imagery used in that prophecy. And then he left it to four leaders, okay? And it was his four, four generals. And he left it to them when he died at 32 years old, he died at a very young age. But before all that happened, he was headed up to Jerusalem. And we can look at the presentation here. So he was headed up uh, into Jerusalem right around here. And on his way up to Jerusalem, uh, they were, I mean, they were going to annihilate Jerusalem. They had plans of destroying it. He had a huge military with him. And the, a, a Previously, he had a vision of this high priest, what he looked like, this high priest in a vision. Well, then they walk into Jerusalem. The high priest was expecting him and all of the priests. They came out in all their garments, and and, and Alexander the Great saw that person who was in his vision. It was that high priest, and he was blown away, and he was scared. Then the high priest takes out the scroll of Daniel, and he shows him where he was predicted and prophesied about hundreds of years earlier. And Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, excuse me, Alexander the Great was in fear of that. And he took a knee and not one person was killed and he didn't touch the temple. They turned around, they did an about face and they left without harming Jerusalem. In fact, he paid homage to the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isn't that amazing? So Alexander the Great, this, this guy in known history, sees the book of Daniel where this high priest shows him and, and he respected the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So then later what happens? So this Antiochus Epiphanes guy comes in, a couple, you know, 100 years later or whatever, but he was... He was of this northern kingdom, which was Syria, Assyria, and they would fight right here in between. He would fight the southern kingdom, which was the pharaoh down here, Ptolemy, and, and the Seleucids were up here, and they would fight. And that's what Antiochus Epiphanes was from, the Seleucids. They would fight each other, and it was horrible. 
So then one day Rome came like this. We, we talked about here, the South was so sick of Antiochus Epiphanes that they called on a new superpower to help them, Rome. So Rome was starting to come into play here. So their navy, the Rome, Rome's navy came down and they destroyed Antiochus Epiphanes' navy and they ended up confronting him and embarrassing him somewhere here in Egypt. And Rome sent a fleet of ships and met Antiochus and warned him. They publicly humiliated him because that's where we get this term, drawing a line in the sand. So what what this Roman general did was he told Antiochus Epiphanes, you better not, he drew a line around him. He said, you better not step out of that line until you show your allegiance to Rome, that you will not fight this you know war anymore. And he was humiliated. He did that before he walked out of that. And that's where they get the term drawing a line in the sand. I'm going to draw a line in the sand right here. You might have said it. You may have said that yourself. There's another one that comes out of the book of Daniel, and it's the writing on the wall. I see the writing on the wall here, right? Well, that came from from where Belshazzar saw a hand appear. (laughs) I think it was the Lord's hand writing on the wall. And it says that he he was, his knees were knocking. He was so scared. And so anyway, that's, the Bible's amazing, right? You know, the Bible's the best-selling book every year that the New York Times doesn't even list it anymore because it always makes number one. Most people don't tell you that. It's, it was kind of a thing I found out not too long ago. It's pretty amazing. All right. So let's get back to the presentation. So on his way back, so Antiochus Epiphanes, this antichrist type guy, on his way back home through Jerusalem, he did the abomination of desolation, right? Spoken of by the prophet Daniel. So he comes up here through Jerusalem and he seizes power here. And he kills many people, many Jewish people. It was a horrible experience for them. And it was during a seven-year period, and it was just an awful time. So Daniel 11, verse 31 says, They shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. And literally it says that makes desolate or that causes horror. It definitely did that, didn't it? So... In Daniel 11, so the verses also say, For many days they shall fall by the sword and flame. Who's they? The Jewish people. They're falling by the sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. This guy did exactly that. He sold many of them as slaves. He killed many. He was a horrible guy. In his attack on Jerusalem, Antiochus IV is said to have killed 800,000 to 100,000 Jewish people. Whoa. Horrible time. 40,000 more he sold, or he uh, had as prisoners, and he sold another 40,000 as slaves, according to history. And he also plundered the temple, robbing it of approximately 1 billion by modern calculations. He placed soldiers around the temple area. He forbid people to worship. He forbid people to sacrifice. So he took away the sacrifice, right? He sent his soldiers through Jerusalem to kill as many babies as they could. What a horrible, evil, demonic man he was. On another occasion, they killed as many women as they could find. Nice guys, right? He erected a statue of Zeus, killed a pig on the altar of sacrifice. We know that the pig is the unclean animal according to the law of Moses, and for that to even be near the temple would be horrible. But here he kills one on the altar of sacrifice. He forced the Jewish people, the Jewish priests, excuse me, to eat pork, sprinkle the juices of the pig all over the temple. So in 168 BC, right before Christ, Antiochus put up a statue of Zeus in the center of the Jewish temple, but it had the face of of Antiochus, according to history. Now, we know that Zeus is a is not a good thing. We know that Jesus in the book of Revelation talks about um, the church where the, the, the seat of Satan was, right? And this is, I think it's in Pergamum, but the seat of Satan is where uh, it, he, he, it was considered where Zeus's altar was. And the Nazis, believe it or not, this is an amazing thing, but the Nazis actually, or the Germans, I should say, they, they took 
this altar of Zeus, and they have it in Berlin, a big museum in Berlin. I think Obama visited there one time. But they, this is an evil thing because it's all about Zeus. It's the worship of Zeus, and he is this prime god there. Okay, And Jesus referenced him as the seed of Satan. Well, they also <laughs> made this Nuremberg place where the Nazis had all these parades and different things like that, right, where Hitler was doing big speeches. And it was there that they had, they set, Hitler's preaching or speaking podium up in the exact place of this replica of where Zeus, his statue, his altar would be. Wow. Do you see the connection with all this stuff, you guys? It's amazing when you really look into history and use the Bible and read the Bible and understand the Bible. But the most important thing is having a relationship with the God who wrote the Bible, who inspired the men to write the Bible, right? Who, by the Holy Spirit, inspired these words because they're God's words. The whole Bible are his words. And that's how you get to know him better by reading the whole Bible. That's how you get to know your Lord and your Savior and have a, a good walk with him. All right, let's get back into that presentation. So this evil, vile guy. So he had a statue of Zeus. This is a Zeus himself, probably put an image of his own face on there and set it up in the holy place of the temple. Horrible guy. So Daniel 11 verse 31 says, And they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place the abomination of desolation. He fulfilled Daniel chapter 11 verse 31. He fulfilled that. That's history. That's what Antiochus Epiphanes IV did. However, there is a future one coming. We're going to look at that right now. So Daniel 11.32, And by smooth words he will turn the godlessness who will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant. So many of the, some of the Jewish priests were Hellenized and they gave in, they weren't courageous, they gave in to this evil guy and they became Hellenistic priests. And they were the priests for Antiochus Epiphanes telling everyone to worship this, this Greek god and all these things. And, and there ended up being a rebellion on this. The good guys rebelled and they fought back on this. There was like a revolution, like the, like the American Revolution in a way. And they fought back and they were even talked about in Daniel as being good. But before that, there, they, we see these priests, some of these priests falling into this trap and this scripture displays that. And this is actually where, believe it or not, guys, this is where they get... The Sadducees, that's where their lineage comes from. They're these Hellenistic or Hellenized uh, Antiochans, they were called. Priests, these Antiochan priests, because the Maccabees rebelled against them and fought against these guys. That's where the Sadducees come from. Well, guess what? Did you know this? Caiaphas, the high priest who tore his clothes and condemned Jesus, he was a Sadducee. And remember, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection right? They didn't believe in life after death. They didn't believe there was a spiritual world, but the Pharisees did. They believed there was. And the Bible records that there were some Pharisees, right? Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, who believed and they were saved. But there, were, there was no record of any Sadducees being saved. There may have been, I don't know, but there's no record of it in the Bible. Interesting stuff, right guys? So God's so good how he put all this together to show us, you guys. So Daniel 11, verse 32, it was by smooth words. So this guy was a type of the future Antichrist. The future Antichrist will be a smooth speaker, and he will turn people away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right. Daniel 11, verse 32 says, But the people who know their God will be strong and take action. Who's he talking about here? He is talking about the Maccabees, the Maccabean revolt, where we get the celebration of Hanukkah from, you guys. This is a good thing. And did you know that Jesus actually recognized Hanukkah? He went into the temple, the winter festival, the winter dedication. That was Hanukkah. Jesus did that. A lot of people don't know that. All right, so the people who know their God is a reference to Judas Maccabees and the group of these good priests that fought back, you guys. And this is an image of him. It could have been from an old coin or something. I'm not sure. But anyway, you can look into that some more on your own. But Judas Maccabees, he drove out Antiochus Epiphanes. He reestablished worship in the temple. They cleansed it, right? They cleaned the temple and cleansed it and rededicated it and reestablished worship in the temple. 
Good stuff. So it's still celebrated today. It's called Hanukkah, right? In John 10, we see Jesus at the at that time, the feast of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. And it was winter, and the Gospel of John tells us, right? There's no other feast but Hanukkah, you guys. And Jesus was walking in the temple area in the portal of Solomon, right? So the, right over here where the Golden Gate is, just to the north uh, on this outer wall, I believe is this place well, that was Solomon's porch or portal. And Jesus walked in through there. And the Pharisees approached him at that time, and the, the elders and the high priests and the Sadducees, and they were saying, are you the Christ? Tell us plainly. And, and Jesus goes in. But Jesus talked about himself being the light of the world, right? So this winter festival, this Hanukkah, is it's a celebration of the lights because this light, miraculous, the, the candlestick or the menorah, right, the seven golden lampstand, which is fed by olive oil, actually. It keeps it lit and burning bright. And they were, the people would look up at the temple area during this fight against Antiochus Epiphanes, and they would see that the light was there in the temple, and it gave them courage to fight. Well, then they ran out of olive oil, but the history tells us that miraculously, right, the miraculously the, the, the light stayed lit. The temple, the menorah stayed lit with a burning fire. Isn't that amazing? It was a miracle. They were out of oil, yet it stayed lit. Amazing, because the church is actually a picture of that seven gold lampstand, because in Revelation it talks about that. The church, the seven gold lampstand was actually a foreshadowing of the seven churches. And that one stayed lit, and it gave people hope, and they call it Hanukkah. And here you see in this video that we just watched, you can see these Jewish people celebrating Hanukkah and lighting the candlestick the seven, from the menorah. Pretty cool stuff, right? I love it. Okay, let's continue on. So then what happens? The willful king, a shift to a future fulfillment. We're going to look at that now. So there's now we're seeing this, this shift from this type of antichrist. This guy was a type in a picture and a portrait, just like Yosef or Joseph was a type in a picture and a portrait of Jesus Christ. But now we're going to see it, him pointing to this future uh, antichrist that Jesus talked about, quoting from the book of Daniel, saying, you know, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, okay? All right, so the willful king. This is a shift, okay? We're going to look at that right now, a shift into the future. So Antiochus Epiphanes, type of Antichrist. Now we see the Antichrist, the one, the future evil, evil man. And we're going to talk about, we're going to see where Paul even wrote about him too. But Daniel 11, verse 36 says this, He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. Now that makes him different than Antiochus Epiphanes because Antiochus Epiphanes put a statue of Zeus in the temple. This guy is going to be above even all the gods of this world, right? So the angel explained to Daniel that this king would blast theme God and exalt himself until the wrath has been accomplished. What wrath? Well, we know that there's a wrath of God coming upon this world, this world system, and, and the, those who follow the devil, basically, right? There is an actual wrath of God. It's like a tsunami that's just being fed by sin, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's this invisible force that goes through the water. It's coming to this world. You can't see it yet, but you will, if you're here someday, you will actually see the wrath of God poured out on this, this world. It's coming. And the angel told Daniel that, speaking of a future time, when this wrath will come. Now, this last church, the Church of Philadelphia, second to the last church, I should say, before uh, Laodicea, who is the bride of the Antichrist, right? But this last church of Philadelphia, which had brotherly love, that's what Philadelphia means. They were in the word of God. This church gets raptured, taken away, and spared from the hour of trial, which comes upon the whole face of the earth, which is God's wrath. We're not appointed to wrath as believers. And that last church, I believe, is the raptured church. They're caught up away before the seven-year period, this great time of trouble that Daniel speaks about, that Revelation talks about. 
that church is spared from this time. So let's let's get back into it here. So the angel explained to Daniel that this king would blaspheme God and exalt himself until the wrath has been accomplished or fulfilled, right? All those judgments we see in Revelation, it's in chapter 6 through 19 of Revelation. That's the, the great tribulation as it's called, okay? So Daniel was told that this revelation pertained to the latter days. You can see that in Daniel chapter 10, verse 14, and Daniel 11, verse 36, begins to look more towards this final world dictator, all right? So Jesus said the real abomination of desolation was still in the future, and that's Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Jesus said that. The Apostle Paul paraphrased Daniel 11.36 in reference to the coming Antichrist. Wow, you're like, what? Really? Show me. Here it is. This is in 2 Thessalonians. Look at this. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of of perdition. That's another name for this vile person, this antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship. That's a reference into Daniel right there. So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. That is a huge scripture right there because that explains who this Antichrist is, it connects Daniel to it, and it connects Revelation to it, because some people think that in 70 AD that was fulfilled because General Titus came in when they destroyed the Jewish temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. They, he, there's, there's a history saying that he uh, slaughtered a pig and did kind of the same thing that Antiochus Epiphanes did, defiling the holy place. Well, that was not him because... Titus did not exalt himself above every god. And Jesus was speaking about the end of time, like the end of all things. And it wasn't, you know, that might have been a little snapshot of it in 70 AD, but that wasn't the final one. In fact, today, you guys, and you could look at this, do your own research on it yourself, but today, Israel, the nation of Israel, there's this thing called the Temple Institute. They are putting together everything needed according to the the books of Moses to erect and to build a new temple, the third temple. Right now in Israel, they are preparing to build a new temple. They have everything ready. The red heifer, the calf, they finally found that recently. That's there. They have that. They have the priestly garments, they have all these things ready. The, the menorah, the seven golden lampstand, it's ready, you guys. So this is, this is amazing stuff. We're still in the Bible. You know, the Bible, we're still in there. Some people think it's just historical. It's all fulfilled. It's all done. I don't get into prophecy, they say, or our church shouldn't get into prophecy. That's just a distraction from the mission of, you know, helping the poor and all that stuff. No, 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 no. Jesus got into it. You don't get, you don't want to be obsessed with it, but you can talk about it and read it and study it. It's okay. Not all the time, but sometimes. That's why I'm doing this episode right now, because this stuff is future, you guys. You need to study the whole counsel of God and understand the big picture. Like you take Joseph's story and you use his story to understand future events because he had a Gentile bride, rejected by his own, then he had a Gentile bride, then he comes back, he saves Israel. Israel comes back to him, bow down, and he saves all of Israel. Moses, Moshe, the same thing. He was rejected by his own. Stephen even points this out in Acts chapter 7. You can look at that. He points out both of them as their first visitation. They were rejected, but Moses was rejected. He was a prince. He left his prince, the the palace, to go to his own people. They rejected him. He left. He went to a Gentile land, right? There he rescued seven Gentile women at a well. There's seven churches in Revelation, right? He marries one. He has one bride, and he's shepherding the Gentile flock in the Gentile land, with his one Gentile bride, and then God calls him back to save who? Israel, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people. During a time of great trouble, judgments came down. Some of those ju- the judgments are the same as what we see in the book of Revelation. So the Bible explains the Bible, you guys. And that's what this channel's all about. We use the whole counsel of God to understand God's plan and to understand him and know him more. 
have relationship with him. That's the most important thing, you guys. All right, let's get back into the presentation. So, so that he sits as God, this is the New Testament, in the temple of God. So there has to be a temple, right? Showing himself he, that he is God. He's speaking about this vile son of perdition, this antichrist. So the church age, you guys, we're going to look at it a little more. So 0 AD, the very first Christmas when Jesus was born, then he died on the cross at 32 AD. He was 33 years old. We don't count the zero. So it was 32 AD. And then three days later, he was raised from the dead. And right now he's at the right hand of the Father, alive and well. We know at 35 AD, Paul was converted. And then at 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. Right around 95 to 100 AD, John wrote the book of Revelation from the island of Patmos. In 1948, we saw a miracle happen. Israel was reborn as a nation. So who knows what's going to happen in the future? We don't know the hour, the day or the hour. Nobody knows that. But in 2023 is today. Um, They're getting ready to build a temple in Jerusalem. We don't know if Ezekiel 38 might happen soon. That seems to be something that could happen because these countries are all lining up as allies, the ones that are described in Ezekiel 38. So things are things are taking place, you guys. We are in the Bible still. The Bible's still alive. We're moving forward in time in that book, in the holy book of the Bible right now. So let's look at his bride. So this bride of his was Laodice the Fourth, right? Laodice the Fourth, named after so Laodicea was named after Laodice. Amazing stuff, guys. The connection there is amazing. So where was this place? Well, here's the world, of course. Let's zero in on it. So here's the Middle East. Here's Israel. Jerusalem's right about here. Egypt is right here. Uh, Saudi Arabia. There's Asia over here. There's Europe. Here's Africa. It is the center of the world, by the way. But over here, what the Bible called Asia Minor, okay, where Paul did a lot of his missionary trips. There's, here's Greece, here's Italy, and Rome was over here. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Again, Israel's right here. But this is what they called Asia Minor. Today, this is modern-day Turkey right here. But this is where the seven churches were. This was basically just the Roman Empire at that time. And there was seven churches. There's a map right here we can look at that shows us even better. So there's an island called Patmos. That's where John wrote the book of Revelation. And in it, he describes in chapter one, the seven churches. I'm sorry, chapters two through three, the seven churches. But chapter one tells us the menorah, the seven gold lampstand was a picture of the seven churches. But here in chapters two and three of Revelation, we see Ephesus, Smyrna, the church of Pergamum, the church of Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, which I believe was that last one that gets caught up to be with the Lord, because in that uh, chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, it says that this church is spared from the hour of trial coming upon the whole face of the world. Then the last church, Laodicea, Jesus isn't even in it. He spits them out of his mouth. They're mixing hot with cold together. So Laodicea was an evil apostate church. So Laodice the fourth, the bride of this Antichrist type, Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth, right? who call himself God. So the church in Laodicea is in Revelation chapters 3, verse 14 through 22. You can look that up if you want. Here's some ruins from it. They, you can see the ruins today. They're still preserved very well. And it was a very rich place. Um, they were very wealthy. This is the actual church. So here's all the churches in, in history. I believe it's kind of like a uh, the church is moving forward in time, being birthed and moving forward in time. I believe the uh, Church of Thyatira could speak of the Catholic Church. The Church of Sardis could speak of the Reformation and the Protestants. And then the Church of Philadelphia could be the evangelicals or just the church of today, the ones who are the true believers. But they're spared sometime in the future, spared from the hour of trial coming upon the whole face of the earth. And then the last church, the seventh one, is the Church of Laodicea, which I believe will be in the tribulation period. So verse 14 of Revelation says that, in Revelation chapter 3 says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. This is speaking of Jesus, guys. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or or hot. Now the hot means like zealous, like zealous for the Lord. And then the cold would be just like indifferent, not even, not even caring about what God thinks. 
And then verse 16 says, So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Or even literally, it's vomit you out of my mouth. Behold, later it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's not even in this church, you guys. Jesus isn't even in it. But he's knocking on the door of the church trying to get in. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. In other words, he'll have communion with you, community with you. He'll, he'll relate with you. You will be saved. So if you're in that tribulation period and you are this left behind church, God still has an open door. He, anyone who hears my voice, voice and opens the door, you open the door to your life, to him, guys, then you will be saved. And here's the picture. This is a famous painting. There's no doorknob. It's Jesus knocking on the outside of that door. That door is your heart. And he says, behold, I stand at that door and knock. Have you let Jesus into your life? If you have not, my friend, you can do that even right now. If you're in Israel, he is the Messiah that Daniel spoke about because earlier chapters of Daniel say that speaking of the Messiah would be cut off you know, he would be cut off by the people of Rome because it was that kingdom after the Grecian Empire. And he was. And then the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, just like Daniel talked about that it would be. But there's a future one coming that's even worse. So Jesus has two comings. The Bible, whole Bible centered around the first coming and the second coming. And it's all about one, one person, one character, and that is Jesus Christ. That's the whole Bible, you guys. It's about him, Yeshua Mashiach, if you're in Israel. He is the Messiah. So Jesus stands at the door and he knocks. You may be feeling the knock on the door of your heart right now. Perhaps the Holy Spirit's knocking on the door saying, let me in. Let him in. Believe. That's the first step. You have faith. You, you trust and you put your belief in him, and then you are saved by grace. That's getting something really good that you don't even deserve. So if you would like to do that right now, right where you're at, this could be the greatest moment of your life. You could be set free and given peace in your heart right now by trusting and, and believing in Jesus, giving it to him. You can do this right now. Just say this prayer after me. You're going to be praying. You are praying to God, all right? You can say this prayer after me to receive in your heart Jesus Christ, to believe in him as your Lord and Savior. Would you like to do that? All right, just repeat these words after me. You are praying to God, all right, from your heart. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry for my sin. Please help me to turn from my sin and to turn to you. I believe that you died on the cross, Jesus. I believe you shed your blood for me. I also believe that in three days you were raised from the dead and that you are alive today. I choose to follow you as my Lord and as my Savior from this day forward. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to follow you. I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, my friend. If you did that, congratulations, all of heaven rejoices over one who repents. Repenting means turning to God, turning away from your old ways and turning to God to follow him. Congratulations. Hey, make sure you're getting involved in a church uh, or a fellowship like One for Israel or the Jews for Jesus. And check out this ministry uh, in Israel right now. You can look at the YouTube videos. are called So Be It great ministry out of Israel where uh, this guy named Jeff and uh, and Elisha, these two guys, they go around making these awesome videos talking about Jesus in Israel. They're both Israeli Jews. They're just awesome guys. I love them. I watch them all the time. So, hey, and don't forget, you can, uh, you can pick up these books. Uh, these are my books, and you can get these at Amazon. And uh, so those are, those are books that you can get. Those are books that I wrote on Jesus in the Old Testament. That's what most of them are about. And you can find those on Amazon. You can find them at uh, other bookstores online, things like that. And uh, you know, feel free to get those. Do a little more research if you want. 
but mostly read your Bible. That's the most important thing, you guys. And don't forget to subscribe, all right? Don't forget to subscribe, uh, you know, and like the video. That helps get it out there. Tell your friends about it. And, uh, and you can check out this uh, video right here. This is a playlist on Jesus in the Old Testament. So, hey, I love you guys. God bless you. And, uh, and I will see you next time.